If you have your ducks in a row and you understand the value of Bitcoin, it can be life changing. If you're stopping contributions to your Roth IRA so you can buy fucking Cardano and Dogecoin and Ethereum, I think you're gonna you're gonna shed a tear or two. This is the Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast, a show where average Joe firefighters explore the most important monetary technology of the 21st century. We talk Bitcoin, we talk finance, and we talk shit. Hello and welcome to another Blue Collar Bitcoin discussion. This episode is a shorter one. It's the first of what we presume will be many episodes we title Bitcoin Tweets. Josh and myself, Dan, find Twitter to be teeming with intellectual and thoughtful insights. Bitcoin and finance thought leaders are extremely active on Twitter. During these episodes, we'll each pick tweets we've bookmarked and spend time bantering about them. Also, if you aren't following us on Twitter, we are at blue underscore collar BTC. Hope you enjoy this one. All views and language expressed by the hosts and guests in this podcast are solely their personal opinions and do not reflect their employers or organizations they are associated with. Do not treat any of the content in this podcast as investment advice or as an inducement to follow a particular strategy. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dan, have you uh, you caught any good tweets lately? Oh, yeah. Twitter is alive. I've got a good one. I want to hear what your thoughts are on it are. This is a tweet from uh, Musk himself. We talked about him a little bit on the last podcast, and man, did we miss the mark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, we the, thought we thought we knew this guy. You know, we did. We did. Yeah, the irony. I mean, last episode, I think I said Elon Musk was made for Bitcoin, which, in fairness, he very well still could be. I mean, he holds one point five billion dollars of Bitcoin on the balance sheet of his company. And I do think there is the, there is some foul play in the back of some of the message he's sending over the last week. I My prediction is he will come back around. He's waiting for an excuse to be like, oh, there's enough renewables involved in the mining of Bitcoin for me to now return. Like That's my prediction of what he's going to do in the future. I heard someone's theory today, and this one's entertaining. Um, and Elon Musk is unpredictable enough that this could even be true. So he said, uh, what was it, a week or two ago when when Tesla sold 10% of their holdings that that was a liquidity test for Bitcoin and it passed. So we're like, all right, that's great. Somebody was speculating that maybe this is a, uh, he's testing Bitcoin again just to see how much uh, how much leverage in this, is in the system, how much, how much uh, it can take in a, a full frontal attack from like, at this point, probably the, oh, the, the hardest attack it could probably take right now is an Elon Musk negative tweet, you know? Like, yeah. And, I, you know, he, almost like a, the idea is like he's playing 4D chess, but I, I don't think I believe that one, but it's an interesting thought. Josh, I'll be honest. The, the fact that the market reacted the way it did to Elon's tweet, it did a surprise me and B it, it bummed me out. But as I've thought more about it, it makes perfect sense. So a lot of the the message or the theme surrounding this bull cycle, which both of us firmly believe we're still in the middle of and that there's huge upside to come. I haven't flinched on that one bit. But the the selling point of this bull market is institutions are coming in, right? And so that's changing a lot of people's thesis on Bitcoin because they yeah. see S&P companies entering. So when the richest guy in the world with the hottest company in the world stacks $1.5 billion of Bitcoin, it is a huge confirmation sign that this could be a good investment. And it also sets the market up for some fragility in price when he tweets that he's no longer accepting Bitcoin for cars because he's worried about energy consumption. So on one hand, yeah, you wish one guy couldn't affect price the way he did. But on the other hand, especially in a hyped up bull run, you can understand why it affects investor conviction, at least in the short term. Yeah, I was actually impressed that the price didn't get hammered worse than it did, especially immediately. It it really held better than I expected. And I guess time will tell if it, it will continue to, but it's amazing that $47,000 mark seems to be a huge spot of resistance. And interestingly, 
you know, we both subscribe to Willie Wu's letter. That's been a spot he's been talking about for a long time. Yeah. Uh, both as resistance, resistance and support. And I think uh, this little cutoff is proving that that is a pretty hard line. Yeah, he is so far proven to be right. We will see. Uh, so with the, Wu. The, the tweet I was actually going to talk about before we teed off about Musk himself <laughs> is working with Doge devs to improve system transaction efficiency, potentially promising. Good Lord. Like, I really sometimes wonder what this dude is thinking. Like, there are no Doge devs unless he has got a team at Tesla working on Doge now. Like, he just he just put together a crack Doge team and said, you guys are going to have to fix this problem. We need more efficient transactions here. Potentially promising. The Doge thing, it's it's gone from funny to not funny just because like things that harm people eventually aren't funny and doge will harm a lot of people because you know like in 2017 i remember cracking up about you know the doge to the moon youtube videos and stuff i mean somebody somebody threw doge together in like two hours to be a total the guy's name's lucky palmer he responded. Did you hear about this guy? He reactivated his Twitter account to respond to this tweet from Musk, the one we just talked about. And he said, I'm going to characterize it here because I don't, I don't have it in front of me. But he said, uh, cause somebody was like, dude, I wonder if the guy who put this together thought about all of this stuff when he did it. And he was like, no, I didn't. I didn't think about anything. I put it together in two hours. You don't understand what a joke this is. Like I put it together on a whim with no expectations of it ever going anywhere. It's just, it's just gone. I mean, insane. This is why to not get harmed in markets and with investing, like you have to learn, you have to learn. I mean, it sounds obvious, but it's super important. Like Doge is mathematically proven to crash. Like it, it's not secure. It's not, it's totally, totally vulnerable to attack based on the way it's running it's programmed to inflate. It's got nobody working on it. Dude, just think of just think of the incentive right now for somebody to blow this thing up. Like if yeah, if they could garner enough energy together to and get the ASICs in order to blow it up, and at the same time they go on Binance and they take a leveraged short position and then blow this thing up. My God, it, it would be payday for them times a thousand probably. And it would be just hilarious. I kind of hope it happens in a, in my evil secret mind. Because you brought up Elon and Doge, <laughs> we'll keep on the Doge train here. Mark Cuban tweets 10 hours ago, Doge has deterministic inflation, meaning the amount of inflation is defined. There is no uncertainty as to the amount of created and its inflation percentage which could allow it to grow as a valid payment mechanism. The unknown is whether enough people will use it this way. Like, is this guy, <laughs> is this guy fucking serious? Like, I don't know, man. I don't know if these guys, these, if they're eccentric billionaires, I don't think Cuban, he never struck me. I could believe Elon is an eccentric, like, like a Davy Bo- David Bowie kind of character. He's just off the wall. Doesn't think about what he says before he says it because he's just crazy Elon. I could believe that. But Mark Cuban, we've both seen enough of him on, you know, Shark Tank to kind of think like this guy's pretty level headed. He probably knows what he's talking about in most things, and he's not. He doesn't seem malicious, you know. And then you, and you have some idea of what's going on in this space, and you hear some of the things he spouts off like that, and you're just scratching your head, like, what is this guy's angle? I've seen Pish respond to a couple Cuban tweets, and he's basically saying, like, Mark, like, for God's sake, like, please, like, do a little research. Like, yeah, a what you're saying is mathematically impossible and logistically impossible. And also, it's going to harm people. I mean, back to the harm thing. Like, I'm not just I don't just call them shit coins because it's fun and funny. Like they they will hurt people. Like there, there are folks out there that are actually leveling into this stuff that have no idea what's going on. With cryptocurrency, they have they they have not conceptualized one bit what digital scarcity even means or how it's created, and they're they're going to lose a lot of money. Like I, I've said, Josh, the interesting thing about crypto 
and we've talked, we've said before, like we don't even, I don't even like to use the word crypto. Like it's Bitcoin. I don't either. But um, it's a bad word. The problem with crypto, and I think the way it'll be viewed in say 30 years, is that for a select few who either got super lucky or did their homework, it's going to be the most prosperous time of their life. It's going to put them in a totally different income stream and degree of wealth, right? It has, it's, some are going to reap tremendous opportunity, but for a lot of others, it's going to be the most painful financial experience of their life that will teach them lessons for a lot of years. So that, that yeah. paradox, that juxtaposition of what this is going to do to people is super interesting to think about. If you have your ducks in a row and you understand the value of Bitcoin, it can be life-changing. If you're stopping contributions to your Roth IRA so you can buy fucking Cardano and Dogecoin and Ethereum, I think you're gonna you're gonna shed a tear or two when uh you are you're paying healthcare bills at age seventy two that you can't afford. Yeah, I, I want to go back to Doge really quick and touch on something that I uh was reading today, which is you know that Doge wallets haven't had any developers or updates since two thousand fourteen. Think about how many weaknesses, how many potential hacking avenues there are for something that is, what is that, seven years old? Like technology yeah, that is seven scary. years old, hasn't been worked on. There's probably a ton of vectors for attack and something like that. You're sitting on, let's say you got lucky here and you're now a doge millionaire and you decide you have diamond hands <laughs> and you're you're holding all that crap on a hot wallet in your computer that's seven years old. You're gonna, you're probably gonna get hurt. Even if Doge does do what you think it might do, you might lose for exactly the reason you didn't expect, which is the technology is just archaic by today's standards. Yeah, I mean that's what that's what the problem is with trading or buying things you don't understand. Is is you know nine times out of ten, nine days out of ten, it works, but it's that tenth day that screws you and. Uh, What's going to happen with Doge is in- incredibly clear. This isn't a bold prediction at all, but what, what's going to happen, and I think we talked about this a couple episodes ago, but it's going to, whether it's at the top, I have no idea. The thing could be worth a dollar eighty for all I know. But at some point, it's going to go from its peak down 2, 5, 10x before anyone can exit. Like You're literally going to be staring at the exchange at... 57 cents wanting to get out at 53 cents and you won't be able to execute until eight cents. Like it's going to be full blown incendiary and it's going to yep. suck for a lot of people. And yeah, yeah. Part of the reason we're seriously part of the motivation for doing this podcast is to help even just some of our friends, <laughs> friends and family, like not get screwed. I've had encounters just recently in the last few days with people that have decided that Doge is a good idea and trying to approach and give a succinct understanding to people who just think, you know, number go up and Doge is going up and don't, number one, the problem is, as we're finding out with this podcast, it takes quite a long time to even lay out the primary basics in order to understand money itself and then to understand cryptocurrency, which we haven't even really dug into the technology behind this stuff at all. And we're on our third episode, three hours in, we haven't even touched on that stuff. And to, uh, to help someone understand why this is a bad idea takes hours of research. I think that, I think it was Michael Saylor recently on a tw- in a tweet said it takes 40 hours of research to even come close to grasping or grokking Bitcoin at all. And then I think, honestly, myself, I have hundreds, if not thousands of hours into reading about this stuff. And when someone approaches me about, is Doge a good idea? I have a hard time just like, with all the thoughts running through my head, like where do I even start to try to give this person an inkling of an idea of how bad of an idea this is? We've seen it before and and Doge just doesn't have anything of substance backing it. It doesn't have, the only reason it even operates is because it's operating piggyback on Litecoin for mining. Yeah, It wouldn't even have a mining network. It would have been a dead project if they didn't piggyback it onto Litecoin. Josh, I'm stealing this from you. You you mentioned this at the firehouse, but I think it's applicable right now. What's happening in this arena really looks and smells a lot like the dot-com boom in yes. the sense that what you have here is paradigm shifting technological advancement. Like the discovery of digital scarcity 
and blockchain with proof of work and all the things tied in that Satoshi created in 2008 is very likely going to completely change the world, much the same way that the World Wide Web did. But when the, when the World Wide Web unleashed, you had everybody recognized it was going to be paradigm shifting, but nobody knew exactly which direction the market was going to go. And so this is what you said to me the other day. I mean, anyone was slapping .com behind a word and their valuations were going 4, 10x, right? Yeah. But then eventually the market coalesced around truth and actual value over time. And a lot of people got totally fucked in the mm-hmm. dot-com boom. Like that's that's similar to what I was saying a couple minutes ago in the sense that like a lot of people look back on that investment hype as like, wow, that really, really hurt me. And then some others made out like bandits, right? The yeah. same is going to be true here. I just think it's way more obvious. Like this would take time for us to fill in and we'll certainly do that. But the network effects and the the math and the the use case and fundamentals behind Bitcoin are just so incredibly obvious compared to the competition that I, I, I don't, you know, once you've done that research, I think nine out of 10 people conclude like Bitcoin is it. Like even, even the people that are doing these altcoin trading videos online, like I'm thinking about MM Crypto, he's got like 200,000 Twitter followers. Like even when he talks, you, you, you surmise very quickly, like 90% of his portfolios in Bitcoin. Like he gets yeah. it. He's just, you know, preying on or utilizing the hype with altcoins to get a YouTube following. But he understands that Bitcoin is the main event. And I, and I found that to be true with most of the altcoin shilling individuals that, that are decent traders on YouTube. You know what I've come to kind of think a, as a parallel in my mind when comparing to the dot-com boom? And Amazon's a great example. If you go back and you listen to videos, uh, interviews with Bezos in the 90s, the mid 90s to the late 90s, he was talking about things that weren't coming to fruition for 10 years. He was talking about delivering in a couple of days. He was talking about Amazon Web Services. He was talking about all the things they do now, but he was talking about that 10 years prior to their actual happening. And the parallels with Bitcoin there are... Bitcoin is forward thinking and it's a slow mover. It's uh, it's kind of like the turtle in the hair kind of thing. These these shit coins are re- are leaping into new technologies, and having not actually fleshed them all out, just you know, it's move fast and break things versus the slow, methodical, you know, see the problem before it hits and be ahead of the game and move yourself up slowly, surely, one notch at a time, and. That's the reason that Bitcoin is so similar to Amazon. It's just, it's going, and it, it's not as good of an example because it's moved so parabolically, but on a long log chart over the next 20 years, I think that you would see some similar parallels to the way Amazon's exploded through the 2000s and the 2010s. The way yeah. that Bitcoin is probably going to explode through the 2020s and into the 30s. I think it's going to be very similar. Mm, uh- Correct me if you or chime in if you disagree, but I think Metcalf's law and the Lindy effect play out pretty similarly across a lot of really effective technologies that take huge market hold. So you look at, you know, and I've I've seen charts of stuff like you you look at telephone, social media, like Facebook, obviously Amazon for an online marketplace. These things gain traction on very similar scales at very similar rates and Bitcoin's pacing out very similarly. It's actually beating the internet uh, for adoption at this rate. The world's just more ready to adopt useful technologies. Like information is so far and wide. The world's so global. Like if a useful tool is created, people learn about it quicker and are able to utilize it faster than ever in history. Yeah, and I think the rate of change will continue to appreciate that way just because of the way you said that. It's the network effect for everybody because of the internet, because of these communications networks that are allowing everybody to learn faster. I heard Alex Gladstein say this week in a podcast, by the way, Gladstein is ascending on my list of favorite people to listen to um, with regards to Bitcoin, but he was just talking saying that 50% of the world 
has smartphones today and that by the year 2025, it's anticipated 70% of people in the world will have a smartphone. That's crazy, especially when you understand how impoverished a lot of the third world is. The fact that 50% of our species has a smartphone. I mean, the the way the world's going to be interconnected is is hard to fully grasp at this at this stage. And it's it's the reason that, like I said, when a useful tool is created on the internet and Bitcoin is a hyper useful tool, it's going to be utilized. <laughs> it's going to be utilized quicker and quicker as decades pass. Those uh those people that are unbanked and those people that don't have the smartphones yet or are just getting them in the third world, those people, unlike us, we have a stable currency for the most part. We have a stable banking system. We have rule of law. In those places like Venezuela, this is actually right now a life changing technology. Like if you asked some Venezuelan, would you rather have the Venezuelan Bolivar in your bank account or some Bitcoin on your phone? The answer is going to be easily unanimous. There's no question. I mean, you're watching a devaluation at 150 to 200 percent a year versus an appreciation of the same rate. Like, it's it's just very obvious to a lot of people in the third world, and it's kind of like in Africa when they didn't they never erected telephone poles there because they skipped that entire technology. They went straight to cell phones and they put up cell towers. They're going to do the same thing here. I just had another tweet here for you. This is a good one. This is a recent one from Pomp talking about Elon Musk. The richest guy in the world bought billion dollars of the best performing asset in the world for the last decade, but is now spending time trying to make an internet joke become more technically efficient. Unreal. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think there could be a game afoot there. Yeah. Dude, Elon Musk, man, the guy amazes me with his ability to create what he's, I mean, just what he's done with Tesla. He's built two world-class companies from zero and, you know, been successful. And I think to myself, like the little things I have going on kind of overwhelm me sometimes. And I'm like, what does it take to do what this guy's done? I don't know if you've ever heard what he's said about what it's like to be an entrepreneur and do a startup. He said, it's like chewing on glass and staring into the abyss. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> One of my favorite quotes from Elon Musk is chewing on glass yeah. and staring into the abyss. But then it's just so sad to me to watch what like he's just done some amazing things for humanity. And I think he'll do a lot more great things. But what he's doing right now just breaks my heart to see a guy as smart as him spreading some of the dumbest things I've ever seen. Like It is like such a dichotomy in my brain that I just can't understand him. I can't. I don't, I don't get them. Yeah. I have the <clears throat> utmost respect. Overarchingly, I have tremendous respect for Elon. Like, if you're, you know, you're, he's terrible. It's like this dude sticking his neck out and pushing our species forward. But I have, I definitely have competing perspectives on him. And I think some of what we're seeing with him backtracking a little bit on Bitcoin, and I am saying a little bit because <laughs> he's still still has $1.5 billion of Bitcoin on his company's balance sheet. So that's uh, saying something. But he doesn't, he doesn't deserve he's, it. Uh, he's very beholden to the government teat. Like he's definitely suckling. Like he is. Yes. From I the heard government somebody teat. call him. I heard somebody on Twitter call him the greatest grifter that's ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah he's, he's a sloppy yeah, hog. Because because when you're when you're in renewables and then you're exploring space, you're unbelievably dependent on the government money printer and subsidies. And so, yeah, yeah, I think a lot of people have called him on this, but him like backtracking, like he understands. I really think he's grokked Bitcoin. Like he gets it. He knows it's the future, mm-hmm. but somebody's telling him like back off of this a little bit. And, uh, yeah, you're, you're going to kill the golden goose, man. That's exactly, I think what's going on as well. I just wish that he could dial it back and just, instead of saying dumb things, just don't say anything, you know? Yeah. Uh, He can't help himself. I found, I just found this tweet from Jimmy song. Uh, I was, it was thinking, I just scrounged it up here. He says, Elon, is that all you got? The Bitcoin community. For those of you that are new, you'll start to understand just how anti-fragile Bitcoin is from here on. Yeah, it does remind me of the Chinese FUD 2017. China China banned some shit. 
the price cuts off massively, people think it's dead, and then it does 4x from there. And people are just like, holy crap. And it, it demonstrates the power of a decentralized open network protocol that doesn't give a crap what one person tweets over a long time period. Yeah. And the unyielding power of the people in this space that really understand what it is and are just not relenting, they're going to buy. They're going to understand this thing. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to buy into weakness and they're going to sell into strength eventually. Yeah. It takes some serious chops to buy into these dips. Like everybody, when you look at a, at a past chart, you're like, Oh, this thing cuts back. I'll buy when it cuts back. But when it's dropping 10% in a day, your your butthole puckers a little bit and it's not easier to pull it's not easy to pull the trigger. Like I I know you made a purchase. I made a purchase this week as it dropped. And it when you've been in for a while, it's easier, but in the beginning you're like, geez, is this thing even close to the bottom? Like it takes some chops. It takes some education and some understanding to realize these are momentary dips on uh yeah. on a on a path to massive upward asymmetry, as you as you have mentioned before. This might age badly here. But I'm proud to say that I bought a little bit more today at uh, just over 47. Mm. Pretty proud of that one. Taking the, we'll just end. Uh, I'll just edit this out if that turns out to be a bad yeah. call. Just just remove it. <laughs> you are uh, cutting off some high to that crack and and uh, storing it away. Thanks for listening into the show. If you enjoyed this discussion, be sure to subscribe on whatever app you're using for podcasts. And if you have time, leave us a review. You can also follow us on Twitter at blue underscore collar BTC. We look forward to you joining us next time on the Blue Collar Bitcoin Podcast.